Hey guys, Retro Badger here. So, we're going to continue our playthrough of the new Star Trek Resurgence game. So, the next chapter is titled The Price of Duty. So, we had a bit of an unfortunate accident in the last scene. Nilly. I'm good. Help me with him. Mm, gosh. Let's get this off. <sighs> Medical. Got one wounded at my location. Carter. You don't look so good. You gotta be more careful. I just got here. I'm not ready to see you two get blown to space dust just yet. Now let's get you down to sick bay. Great. Well, at least he survived. Status report. The repair crew made it inside. EPS flow is back to nominal levels. The SIF is back up. How does this affect mission readiness, Mr. Ermott? Releasing the docking clamps using hull polarity minimized damage to the Resolute. We'll have some last-minute repairs to make, but if we reapportion some of the staff, we can make our departure on time. As of now, however, we are successfully moored to the station. Good to hear. Send updates to my ready room. Commander Rydek, with me. You know, I'm hearing the odd audio, uh, sorry, audio glitch there. Some people have reported. Oh, of course, yeah, he's not happy, is he? He's sulking. You disobeyed my orders. Well? I'm sorry for that, Captain. I did you what disobeyed I thought was my orders! And not just in front of the bridge crew, but the Starbase staff as well. That's going to get around. My name's already tarnished around the fleet. But what is it going to do to my credibility on this ship? He's saying... From the top to the bottom. Bridge to lower decks. He's saying his credibility is worth more than two lives. Really? Captain, I told you I'd be honest. So here it is. Maybe I shouldn't have disobeyed a direct order. But you were wrong. You weren't on board and you didn't have all the information. So I made the right decision for the ship. If you're worried about your credibility... Put your ego aside and trust your crew. Ooh. Trust me. You might have won some fans on the bridge with that stunt, but not everyone. Lieutenant Commander Chovak has already bent my ear. I'm sure he doesn't take it personally. He'll get over it in time. Mr. Chovak is more complicated than he would want to admit. I guess we all are. Okay. And... If I'm being honest, I'm not sure what I would have done in the moment either. You never really know if you weren't in those shoes. So, let's just boil it down to you did what you had to. Thank you for understanding, sir. I'm sure no one knows the burden of command as well as you do. I'm sure you will, someday. Can we smooth that over? Despite it all, we got our final Starfleet clearance to depart. So if you'll fetch Mr. Ermot, we'll knock out the final details of any outstanding repairs, and then we'll set out for Hotari. Yes, sir. I think we smoothed that one over, just about. Ooh, that's a steam runner, I think. It's not a ship. All I ask is a tall ship. All departments reporting full mission readiness. We've got our full complement on board. This is my favorite moment, right now. The start of a new mission is always full of possibility. The Orion Syndicate could sell it as a drug. <laughs> Don't let the Admiralty hear you say that. Captain on the bridge. 
Sit. Sit, everyone. You all know, I'm not big on speeches. We're embarking on the first mission since our refit. Let's make it a good one. Disengage docking clamps. Docking clamps released. Thrusters ahead, Mr. Handar. I'm not sure what's happening with the audio right now. The first time I played through this, it was absolutely fine, and now we're getting a bit of stutter. I mean, here we go. I wonder what speed this ship was capable of then. As we know, it had some sort of experimental engine. That's a cool shot. Set a course for the Hotari system. Prepare to go to war bait. Aye, Captain. You know what? You take this one. Ooh. Me? Oh, here we go. Got to be. Engage. You know, I like it how they did that. Kind of reminds me of the end of Picard Season 3 with the uh, seven of nine when she said it and the camera cut off. <laughs> it's like she took too long deciding. Simple, but effective. Easy, uh -oh. thank you. I'm fine. Really, I... Uh... You don't look so good. Oh dear. Oh, of course, the, um... I have to get to sickbay. Go. Oh, gosh. Commander, help me get her inside! Oh, dear. That was unexpected. Guess science guy was right. Well, that was quite a scare. A few minutes more and it would have been one of the shortest tenures on record for a first officer. Is that the engineer that was out on the hull? That storm did a real number on him, but he'll live. Just needs rest. You should worry about yourself. Your deridium levels got dangerously low and destabilized your cell structure. This is definitely one of the more memorable first days I can think of. My name is Dr. Aram Duval, Chief Medical Officer. To be honest, I've never met a Kobliad before. You're rare, I know. I was going to say special. <laughs> Your people's numbers have dwindled, despite the Federation's efforts to find a more readily available alternative to the deridium you need to survive. Yet you joined Starfleet, and manage to thrive. I imagine the responsibility must be overwhelming. Maybe even a burden at times. It does make me unique, but it's not a burden at all. I'm honored to be Kobliad, to represent my people. As you should be. And don't worry, I won't treat you like a science experiment. I just do the science and leave the experiments to Solano. You don't agree with his methods? I don't agree with his definition of acceptable risks. Not when the lives of your crew are at stake. Mm. My professional opinion is that the accident took a toll. More than he's willing to admit. He's overstressed, operating in the pressure cooker of his own mind. Which is never a good headspace when the lives of your crew are at stake. What concerns me is that now he's even further away from the thing he's been chasing his entire career. Breakthrough discovery. A major innovation. Something he can put his name on. But the more the time passes and the further out of reach it gets, the more risk he'll be willing to take. I hear you. But that's my job, isn't it? To make sure that doesn't happen. And we don't lose sight of the bigger picture. 
Which is exactly why I'm so glad you're here. We need you now more than ever. And I have to give you credit for what happened on the bridge. It took guts to defy a direct order. Huh. I guess word travels fast around here. It's a small ship, mm. and everyone's curious about the new XO. Fortunately, your cell structure is almost completely stabilized. And I'll spare us both the lecture, but I do feel it's my responsibility to remind you, without regular infusions of deridium, you will not live. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Oh, we made friends with the... Understood. Chief and Medic. Medic. My work here is done. If you're friends with the Chief Medic, it goes a long way on a starship, I reckon. Lieutenant Bedrosian. I came to see if you were okay. We were all pretty worried on the bridge. No one knew what was happening. I don't want anyone to worry. This is just part of who I am. It doesn't define me. Of course. I completely understand. And I would probably feel the same way if I were you. You trusted me earlier with the shields. And I appreciated that. I want you to know that I have your back. Thank you. Oh, so we've made a few friends already. I like how she doesn't go to see him. <laughs> the emissions that gave you that burn are quite unusual, like everything else that goes with this storm. That's a combination of hyronolin and lectrazine to counter the radiation effects. That should help speed your healing. She's come by a couple of times to see you already. Be brief. It's good to see you awake again. I was starting to get worried. Not that you aren't in good hands with Dr. Duvall. You did take one hell of a shot, though. Ah, come on. You know you can't get rid of me that easy. Don't push me, Diaz. You do not want to see me try. No, nope. <laughs> I am not getting on your bad side. I am a formidable enemy. <laughs> Millie was looking in on you too, by the way. But since it's just us right now, I... I had a chance to think about this while I was away. And I thought it was important that I just come out and tell you. Instead of tiptoeing around it. Or worse. Great. Leaving it unsaid. Turning into a love story now. now this is just a guess, but you like me. Is that what this is? How'd you know? Must have been pretty obvious. Which is funny because kind of came out of nowhere for me. Well, this is awkward. First. Oh. You didn't exactly hide it. <laughs> I wasn't exactly trying to hide it. But since it's that obvious, we've been really good friends for a long time. I want to see if there's more between us. Than just being friends. Let's be awkward. And this is all kind of unexpected. I didn't expect this either. But here we are. And I didn't want to ignore it. I just figured I'd steer right into it. Well, what do you think? Ugh. I what shall I pick? As direct as I can stomach. You can Let's be that. neutral. That's a lot to think about. I know. I know it is. So, maybe I should think it over. Oh, yeah. Yeah, take as long as you need. I get it. But, don't leave me hanging. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> the patient needs to rest. If he wants to get back to his old self. Turning into a soap of opera, this. Get better. And while you're resting up, think about what we talked about. What do you guys think of that? Putting relationships in this? I don't know. I think it was a bit of a distraction, to be honest. I don't know. Is it filler, perhaps? Approaching the rendezvous point outside Atari space. Helm, bring us out of warp. Dropping to impulse. Ooh. Ionic interference surging, Captain. Whoops. Shield integrity holding. We can take it. We are at the correct coordinates to meet the shuttle. Commander Rydeck, 
Find us our diplomat, if you will. Aye, Captain. Let's reduce the noise. Filter out environmental signals. Mm, okay. I can manually tune what's left for Federation signal types. Oh, that's cool. Be hiding. I've located the shuttle. Opening comms. On screen. Now, if you've seen... Shuttle to Resolute. Oh. Shuttle to Resolute. Debris field. Lost maneuvering. Now, I wonder if this will be Losing. the one we saw in the trailer. I can't get it any clearer. You'll know who it is. Won't get a transporter lock. It's just not happening. Power up the tractor beam. We'll pull them directly into the docking bay. Mm. So if you've seen the trailer, you you'll know who Diaz. this is. I think. You good to run the tractor emitter? Yes, sir. <sighs> you sure? I'm sure. USS Excelsior. Come on, Diaz. Interesting. So the Excelsior's still in service? First thing, lock onto the shuttle and stabilize the rotation. Oh dear. It is NCC 2000. That's amazing. So that's so Sulu's ship is still in service. I wasn't aware. We're in debris. I'm on it. Oh great! Use the tractor beam. Oh. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Mm. Oh no. kind of think a computer would do this, really. At this point in the future. Uh oh. Have I missed one? Phasers? That's gonna take out the shuttle. Diaz, the bridge. There's a large piece of debris headed for the shuttle. The tractor beam can't handle it. Can our shields take it? I believe so. Commander Rydek, plot an intercept course. On it. Hmm, okay. We're going to ram into it then, I guess. Here we go. Maneuvering thrusters bearing 53 Mark 17, 200 meters on an intercept course. Maneuvering. The audio seems to have sorted itself out now. It's not stuttering anymore. Ooh. Got it. Whoa. Someone's working hard on the bridge. <laughs> Shuttlecraft on board. Good job. We're on our way down to meet them. Hmm. Yep. Terra firma, so to speak. Ambassador Spock. Wow. No wonder he was on the Excelsior. Probably wanted to be on it. The captain will be right down to meet you, sir. In that case, I will wait for him here. Now that's not Leonard Nimoy. But he really sounds like him. Ah, uh, what would you say to Spock? Apologies for the landing, Ambassador. I was operating the tractor beam, sir. I take responsibility. Our arrival was the smoothest part of our journey. 
Your artistry with a tractor beam is commendable. We thought we were prepared for our arrival in Hotari space, but it is evident my craft was not sufficiently robust for such intense ionic activity. The storm has been pretty intense. There was an element that was most unusual. Before you came to our aid, our maneuvering thrusters and impulse engines were rendered inoperable. So we attempted a short traversal at warp speed, only to find that we could not achieve warp at all. Even though our diagnostics computer showed no faults or anomalies. What do you make of that? When all indications say that warp speed is possible, but in practice, we find it is not. Well, this storm is one of the strangest phenomena we've ever encountered. It's disrupted other systems. Who knows what it might do to a warp drive? Yes, it would seem further investigation is called for. Take readings, run some additional diagnostic checks, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Quite logical, Petty Officer... Uh... Carter Diaz. Sir. I'd forget my name, me. Thank you. Ambassador Spock. Excuse me. I'm honored to have you aboard. I'd like to get right to it. We're already behind. It's the first thing you say to Spock. Come on. I'd so be asking him about the Enterprise. The Tribble incident? Oh, there's so many things you could talk about. Ooh, provocations of war. Of course, yeah, the uh, two sides. Ambassador Spock, my senior staff. It's not every day that a captain gets to welcome a Starfleet legend aboard. Hmm. You flatter me, Captain Solano. But legend implies the past tense, whereas I am very much focused on our present circumstances. I didn't mean to suggest you were <laughs> stuck in the past. You're right, Ambassador. Not the most diplomatic choice of words. Your experience comes from the past. But our present situation calls for it. True enough. We were hoping you could fill us in on the details. We got the basics from Starfleet. Two formerly peaceful neighbors are now on the brink of war. Indeed. And the tension between them grows fiercer by the hour. Olivia and Hotari. The Lydians are the more advanced species. They made first contact with the Hotari over a century ago. This is Tau, the Hotari moon. It is rich in dilithium, and for decades, the Hotari and the Olydians have shared a mining operation there. The Olydians provide the technological resources, while the Hotari have served as the labor force. The stability of that arrangement was the source of their peace until recently. The Hotari have suddenly and forcefully seized control of the mining operations and expelled the Olydians from their system. That is the official story, as told by the Hotari when they requested Federation mediation. But the details remain scant. Communications between all parties have been limited by the ionic interference. Hmm. Have the Elidians retaliated against the Hotari, or taken any action against them? Surprisingly, they have not yet responded in kind. They were open to a Federation presence, but it is unlikely the relatively primitive Hotari forces would stand a chance against the Elidian fleet in open war. Left unchecked, this conflict will result in more bloodshed, which is what we are here to prevent. And the dilithium trade hangs in the balance. Clearly, the Hotari have been exploited in this relationship. Maybe we can persuade them peace is the more profitable alternative for everyone. They both profited from the mines. And for the Hotari, something is better than nothing. Peace is our objective, after all. We can call it profitable or mutually beneficial, but at the end of the day, the Hotari are still being exploited for their own resources. 
True peace is not merely the absence of war. And as such, this conflict will surely come again. Neither the Elidians or the Hotari are members of the Federation, so we can't make them do anything. There is an additional complicating factor I should mention. In the past, the Federation has relied on the Elidians as a source of dilithium. Mm. That certainly changes things. The Federation sources its dilithium from a lot of places. Yeah, and this is one of them. We could use that as leverage with the Elidians. They'll want the Federation to continue buying from them. There might be something to that, Commander. Putting that Good. on the table could make the Hotari more hostile. Given the Federation's involvement in the Illidium Dilithium trade, Captain Solano and I must make every effort to appear neutral in these negotiations. What worries me is if this whole thing unravels and we're at the mercy of the storm at less than full strength. We can't let it come to that. Considering what the Ion Storm has done to our ship and the Ambassador's shuttle, we have to assume the Illidian fleet has had problems with it as well. This recent surge in the energy disturbance temporarily levels the playing field. Mm. Commander Westbrook is correct. The energy anomalies around the Hotar systems storm. have been noted in the past. But they have never been observed on the orders of magnitude we have seen in recent weeks. That may answer why the Hotari were able to strike back after so long. They finally had an opportunity, and they took it. That would also explain the Illidians' restraint. And reason to learn as much about the energy anomaly as we can while we are here. We do not want to be caught at a disadvantage of our own. I think we're in pressing spot. I trust we understand our circumstances. We're operating on a strict timetable here, and we're going to be leaving for the negotiations shortly. Commander Westbrook, I want you to leverage our systems to investigate the anomaly from here while we're gone. Hi, Captain. Thank you all. Dismissed. I really do not like the Captain. I just do not I like I want him. to speak to both of you privately. Who? Ambassador Spock, I'd like to make a formal introduction. My first officer, Commander Jara Rydek. Commander. As you are aware, there are limits to what Captain Solano and I can do in our official capacity as representatives of the Federation. But someone in an unofficial capacity, your first officer, for example, would not be bound by those restrictions. Oh? Commander Ryder could ingratiate herself to certain parties behind the scenes, where they may be more candid in revealing information that could lead to a resolution. She certainly... Goes her own way. Is that because she's half human? That helps in this case. It would be unconventional. Like Spock. But I'm not opposed to it. I'm perfectly happy to work outside the lines. And by extension, you will be doing your duty, Commander. Just not too far outside the lines. <laughs> well, I hope Commander Rydek will have more luck finding out what really happened than we will through official diplomatic channels. The fate of the negotiations, the interests of the Federation, and prospect for peace may very well depend on it. Hmm. I wasn't sure about having Spock in this, to be honest, but it goes really well. And we can interact with him as well. How cool is that? So we're going to be bending the rules a little. Oh, do you know, I really hope we see the Excelsior at some point. That'd be neat. Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments. But I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. <laughs> Especially when I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. I am not the chief engineer of this shuttlecraft. The ambassador asked me to take a look, and I'm ready to crack this thing open. Good. You could learn from Mr. Diaz's focus. I'll take notes. 
then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. It Vulcans. seems like he's warming up to us. Yeah. Even Chovok has to look at that face and know you've earned some real respect. And I have to admit that I owe you one. You were right to make me go first. I don't know what I was thinking. You've pulled me out of trouble how many times? Call it even. Okay. At the very least, maybe I can track down that bottle of Saurian brandy you're still on the hook for. But first, we have work to do. Ready to go? All set. Let's run the diagnostic. So... I know about your talk with Miranda. You... you do? She sent me a Priority One dispatch right after your conversation. Yes or no, that's one thing. But I can't believe you said you needed to think about it. I... I did need to think about it. Well, you can't leave this unsettled. It's not fair to her. She was direct with you. Didn't play games. Neither should you. Well, honestly, I was worried you wouldn't approve of, uh, you know, fraternization with... Don't make this about me. You can see where this goes between you two, or you can stay friends. But don't screw this up. I like my friends, and I like our group. I don't want to lose that. Is that thing done yet? Yeah, yeah it's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown. The backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. Would you even get a trill tattoo? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Wonder if anyone's ever done that, like a major Star Trek fan. Maybe even Chakotay's. Here. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? What are we doing? There was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. The warp field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look. Subspace variance out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Suspicious. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings, and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. They're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance, or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked, or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. Let's not overcomplicate this. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the nacelles for a cracked coil. Oh, cool. We'll get a tricorder. So I'm assuming it operates like the phaser did. Oh, look at that! You can actually see the screen on the tricorder finally. Can we scan a person? Oh, right trigger. Hang on. Right. So it's a bit like an, an x-ray machine, isn't it? 
LB and RB to switch between different scan modes. Okay. Radiation scan mode, so it's like X-ray then, isn't it? Oh. Oh yeah, it's, so it's not going to be X-ray, is it? Can you imagine? <laughs> you go to the uh, the doctor and um, you get a dose of X-rays every time they scan you with a tricorder. Now I'm confused because. I missed something? Nope, we don't want to scan that. Hmm. Interesting. I checked every coil on the port and cell for imbalances. If any coil in either engine were cracked, I would have detected it. So, it must be the navigation array. Except it's not. Checked and double-checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. You know, there's a YouTube video where somebody's actually made a tricorder. It's a complete replica and it looks absolutely incredible. Hey, going planet side? Yep, as soon as the negotiating team comes down from the bridge. And you've got your hands full, opening every compartment on this shuttle. I hope you're not just trying to keep busy to avoid thinking about some other things. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. And lucky for you, I've got a ride to catch. Uh, relationships. I'm actually done thinking about it. I've made up my mind. You have? Hey, Maris. Aren't these those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari. That another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> Gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. I noticed one in his ready room. Later. He had a, a steam engine on the wall. You don't want to miss your train. I do have to go. So, you said you made up your mind. <sighs> you have something you want to say to me? The train is leaving the station. Oh dear. I think we should keep things the way they are. You're one of my best friends. And you mean so much to me, and I don't want to risk losing Did I make the right decision? I really don't. I understand. I gotta go. Sorry. Oh, see it's gone red. Can you see that in the top left hand corner? Rare achievement. That went well enough. <laughs> It'll be fine. Did I do an unpopular right, choice there? Where were we? Oh. So the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You want to take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands-on maintenance. I like it. Okay, the nav computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double-check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, we'll know it. Yeah, that warp Let's engine. Run the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Warp drive, sorry. Love that TNG noise with the warp. Same. Warp field inversion and a cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if the subspace variance was a momentary occurrence? That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. 
Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Alright. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. That's weird. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure returned non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? Put the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should warp just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Uh -oh. Static field intensity, warp 1.1, 1.2. Oh, cool. 3. Warp pressure is destabilizing. Error in warp field calculation. Warp 10. The warp drive has experienced a system wide cascade failure. Warp field collapsed. Subspace variance is out of tolerance. Cochrane formula results are undefined. Bingo. What -o? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship. Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us. The Resolute will not sustain warp. Uh-oh. We can't leave Hotari space. I'm sure we'll figure this one out. We do have Spock with us. Maybe something to do with the asteroid field? Oh, look at this. Hmm, getting some vibes from um, a final Unity, you know, the Next Generation game. Some of the alien worlds that you visit on there. Oh, look at this. Seat of Power. Ambassador Spock, Captain Solano, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you've come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours. And this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind and unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. We are honored to be here as representatives of the Federation. I'm so glad. These must be the representatives of the mighty Federation. Oh, uh, here we go. The reigning authority in the galaxy. Or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But, either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin, and this is Citron, the heroes of the Revolt in the Mines. Hmm. Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. Interesting. Quite a complicated diplomatic mess from the looks of it. I think we're about to begin. So is this like a... Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? <laughs> I don't know what we're walking into here. But that guy was something. That may be true. But let's keep an open mind the going into the negotiations. Slightly arrogant. Hopefully he's just one voice amongst many. Then let's hope he's the outlier. The Hotari have invited us as their guests, so we must show them the proper respect. Indeed. He didn't bow, did he? No, I really do not like this captain. Show strength. What? The ferrets? Eh. I'm copying what Spock did. 
You always show respect though, don't you? Ambassador Spock, welcome to Holtari Prime. The honor is mine, your majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Hotari people and their queen, but a recognition of mm. our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elidian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. <laughs> but his point is well taken. What is the Federation's interest in this matter? Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. I'm trying to keep an open mind here, but it's not easy. I <laughs> thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Kobliard? She's not part She can of speak for herself, can't she? <laughs> then let her... Oh, boy. Uh... I could never be a diplomat. I'd say something that would offend probably most of the room without realising. Now then, what is your name? Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. Being a Kobliard, you would know better than anyone. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. Their injustice towards the Kobliard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Alidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! If after all the Kobliard suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? Now that's tricky. I would write the wrong, I would seek peace. I can't speculate on that. Ooh. Well, Starfleet, I'm going to seek peace. There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. Perhaps, Commander Rydek. Perhaps. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No. It was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our minds. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? Mm. I want the truth, not your Federation rhetoric. Hmm, okay, this is going to be controversial. It's possible the Federation has an interest in both peace and securing a steady source of dilithium. One does not preclude or prevent the other. But that's just my personal opinion. Given the Federation has done business with the Elidians for decades, 
I would agree. It's entirely possible, if not highly likely. She figured it out, I think. So what they haven't sorry. said but cannot deny is a simple truth. The dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without a Lydian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone, especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. Don't tell me. Who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on Tau? Neither of them. Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidian? I can't answer that. What? Can only be one or the other, not both. I'll just pick one. If there can only be one, Eeny, meeny, miny, then mo. it would be in the best interest of all involved if the Elidians resumed operation of the mines. And that is why we should not trust our fate to the Federation. She speaks sense. You do well to listen to her. And you do well to hold your tongue. We will take back our minds by any means necessary. Then you will see more blood spilled. I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives. I would agree, Ambassador Spock. Interesting. He's got an interesting personality, that uh, Majesty, hasn't she? I think this is best left to those of us with more experience in diplomatic matters. Couldn't agree more. Oh, that was pretty bad to be honest. <laughs> oh, the look he gave her. Spock and I will cover everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? Right, okay. Well, I think that's a good opportunity to end the episode. We've made some pretty good progress, I think. I'm not sure how I handled the diplomatic side of things. That remains to be seen. However, we covered quite a few chapters this time. Those chapters were definitely smaller. What do you guys think about the relationship side of things? Uh, I'm not sure if it belongs in this story personally, but well, I do like the fact that we have Spock. That is really neat how we can interact with him. And the guy who plays his voice, very impressive. Well, thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye for now.